So, okay, so now we're getting to finally to Deacon's story about the origin of language, and in fact, he, um, he in this chapter cites, right in the beginning, he cites Rousseau, right? And you recall Rousseau? Uh, he said, you know, remember the, it's Rousseau's story, he had the story about the, the well, right? Where uh, sort of the, 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 the boys and the girls get together and they fall in love and the boy has to speak and that's how language starts, right? And so he's, he links it with this story of love and that's how Deacon does it, in fact, right? Because he looks to sexual selection as, um, as the origin of language. And how did he do this? He, well, he, he talks first about the way in which human reproductive patterns are, in fact, unstable and anomalous. They're, they're, they're very strange and they're, they need to be explained because they're very different than uh, similar um, uh, creatures. And what's, you know, what's particular about human reproductive patterns is that humans live in these long-term um, uh, pair bonded relationships with exclusive sexual access, but they exist, these, these pair bonded couples exist within multi-male and multi-female groups where the males provide food to the, to the females and the children. Typically, in that kind of a situation, the males would never be sure whether they are the true fathers of their children, right? And so this is a really very unstable type of relationship, and, the, and it actually needs to be explained. So he's saying that all humans live, most, well, I, pretty much all humans live in this type of environment, and you recall, this is kind of the, 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 the argument that Rousseau was making as well. You recall, he said that the sort of the earliest kind of humans, or I guess maybe pre-humans, they all lived in their families, and they didn't interact with anybody else, right? And uh, and so and the, and the, and they had to they had to reproduce through incest, right? Um, and that is only with language that humans were able to live together in in larger groups beyond the single family, right? And um, and Deacon is really looking at the same problem and says, well, how is it that humans can live in these larger groups beyond the single family, right? Uh, because you, you get this problem of this, uh, you know, of, of paternity, right? Um, and you know what he what he talks about are different examples of other mammals and how they live. So you know the one thing he indicates is that if you have these sort of pair bonded couples, I and mean, he talks about gibbons, for example, but you can you know talk about different types of birds that that live just as pairs, but they all live isolated as pairs. They don't live in larger groups. And the reason is because that's the only way they can be sure of paternity. In fact, in these sort of pair bonded types of species, um, the male will always be fighting off any other males that try and come near the nest or near the home, and the female will fight off any other females that uh, also try and come near that nest, right? So, so pair bonded relationships uh, in, in other species, they only exist when those pairs are, are isolated from a larger group. On the other hand, there are animals that live in groups um, and, and hunt, and this is the, the example of these, he talks about lions and wild dogs. What's, what goes on there, though, is that in, in, the, in the case of lions, first of all, there will be many females and then just one or two males who are sure of paternity, and in fact, those males don't do very much in, in terms of helping to, to hunt for prey and then pr providing it for the um, uh, for the lions, for the, for the females, and the children. Uh, so there, again, here there's a, there's a situation where there's no pair bonding, but there's this group living. And then he talks about wild dogs in which, um, I'm not going to go into the details, but essentially they're in, in, in a pack of wild dogs. You've got a group and you've got males and females, uh, but what happens, there will, there will always be a, a particular, a particular um, male in the group that, that will be the one that's sort of in line for doing all the reproducing, and that sort of rotates from male to male, right? And so, uh, again, here, paternity is clear, and then there's a kind of, kind of rotation system in terms of reproduction, right? That, uh, but again, it's, it's not really a pair bonding kind of system, right? And so, you know, what, what needs to be explained then amongst humans um, is how they're able to match up this sort of pair bonding with, uh, with living in a group. And the, and the key here is that, uh, what, what, what he thinks needs to be explained uh, is how these early, uh, these pre-humans were able to get access to meat, right? So as, as opposed to 
you know, chimpanzees that just eat fruit and just very occasionally will hunt. Um, what he's indicating is that one of the ca primary characteristics of human development is that they, they were hunters. And what's, what's important here is that if they're hunters, then the males had to get together as a group to be able to hunt. At the same time, when they do that, they'll be collectively away from the females, and they can't be sure that the females aren't going to be uh, philandering with other males. And so how are they going to be sh sure of that? Also, in order to, the reason they need to be sure of it is because if they're not sure of it, then they won't be providing the meat to, uh, to the females or to, to their children, right? Because they're not sure of their paternity, right? So, so the key is that you need to figure out a system where there's a, a group of males that can be go off hunting, but that the individual males will then provide meat to the, to the female and to the children, right? Um, and <coughs> the, the solution, he says, is, um, is a social contract based on promises um, that can only be constructed in a symbolic system, which is to say you need the, the male and the female, they need to promise to each other that first th th they'll, they'll, they'll be sort of sexually exclusive, that the female won't be philandering with other males and the, and, and the male won't be with other females, and that <coughs> that will be the basis of an arrangement whereby the male and the female will pair bond and the male will be always providing food for the female and the children. And because it's a promise, it can't be based on an indexical kind of relationship, because an indexical relationship, reco you recall, is a correlation of fact. Right? It's, 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 a, it's a correlation in which you've seen this thing that's happening in the past, right? and a promise is not something that's you know, happening in the past, it's something that happens in the future, um, and you can't make a promise based on indexical relations. A promise is based, it's a symbolic relationship. It's, it's, it's something that you say that you will do, um, and um, and it's a set, it creates a set of prohibitions, right? And in a sense, that, that set of prohibitions is the same type of prohibition as we talked about when we talked about the foraging for the fruit. When you, you've gotten the fruit in one place, you're not going to go back there. Well, in, in the promise of sort of sexual exclusivity, basically you're going to have to remember that symbolic promise when you've got that impulse you know, when the woman sees the other man, the man sees another woman, there's going to be that impulse, and they're going to suppress that impulse in favor of that symbolic promise, right? And so it's, again, um, feeling the impulse, but then suppressing it for something else, right? And so that's that basic, that basic structure of relationship, but also integrated within a uh, in symbolic system. And here, he, you know, Deacon doesn't provide any details about how this might work, but certainly, you know, kinship roles that are defined by marriage are also ones that are uh, where people are assigned to different roles uh, based on their category, based on their relationship to other people, right? So he talks about, um, you know, a wife, a husband, an uncle, those are all categorical relationships that are defined through relationships to other categories in a sense, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's basically a set of sign-to-sign -sign relationships that define those kinship, um, kinship bonds, right? And so he sees then marriage as the solution to the problem of how these pre-hominids were able to combine group living, hunting, and pair bonding, right? Uh, because marriage is a system of promises. It defines a particular set of kinship relationships that are really, in fact, sign to sign relationships, and they do so in a way that creates the, the types of prohibitions that are necessary in order to make um, pair bonding, group living, and hunting, all three come together in a way that can be stable, right? Um, and so he's indicating here that, that marriage was, was something that could have been invented, invented by pre-hominids because it involves a simple sign system that doesn't require very many symbols and really actually very few operations. Really, it's really just a matter of, well, who's allowed um, to copulate with whom, right? That's basically yes or no, and then there's just a few symbols that would, that would sort of be the, the operators of that relationship, right? 